for joining us and for sharing this Friday afternoon with all of us in what I'm sure is going to be a very exciting event. As we speak to you today, we, we definitely live in turbulent times. Uh, companies are facing a lot of uh, cost cutting, uh, budget revisiting, uh, tough decisions, including layoffs and, and whatnot. Uh, and in these kind of scenarios, we all, we all need a bit of inspiration. And this is pretty much why um, Conscious Capitalism or the Spanish chapter of Conscious Capitalism, Capitalismo Consciente, is organizing this kind of, this kind of sessions. We, we're glad to, that, that you were able to join us and, and I'm sure you, you're gonna enjoy it because we prepare a very, a very interesting event. Um, to me, the, the, the main thing I want to start by doing is to, to thank uh, GVC Gaesco, our sponsor for, for this event. It's, it's great. It's great to have you on board and it's great to have your, your support. In fact, allow me to say a few words in, in Spanish about GVC Gaesco. Uh, queremos agradecer la, la colaboración de GVC Gaesco, un grupo financiero con más de 50 años de experiencia, especializado en finanzas personales, wealth management, gestión de activos, research y banca de, de inversión. Gracias, GVC Gaesco. Thank you for, for your help. It is through this kind of collaboration that we are able to actually make a bigger impact. We are able to help more organizations to inspire, to learn, to transform themselves into more conscious businesses. And this is great that, that we, can, we can actually do that. And obviously, I want to start by also thanking uh, Yolanda and introducing Yolanda. It's, it's a familiar face for, for many of you, even for most of you. Yolanda Trevino is one of the founders of the um, Spanish chapter of um, Conscious Capitalism. And, and she is, as a, as a businesswoman, as an entrepreneur, is someone who's been for many years following very closely on everything related to the future of work, new ways of working, and anything that can make organizations both more productive and more human. Thanks for your time and the preparation of this event and uh, over to you, Yolanda. Thank you so much, Alfonso. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, it's been an honor today to be the one conducting this session. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, he's uh, international reference in corporate values. Corporate values impacting employees' experience, based uh, especially in a culture where employees, people are first. Good morning for you, Key. Good afternoon for you all, and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks. It's very much morning here in Dallas, Texas. So. Yes, it's both for us. We, we are just entering in our afternoon. <laughs> We're going to get deeper in our conversation about uh, what you call every step we take is a reflection of our values. But before, allow me just to well briefly explain about your career and your background. We couldn't spend really we could spend the whole session about uh, talking about your achievements and your professional life, but I'll try to brief <laughs> summarize it. So uh, I'll present you as a co-founder and past chairman and CEO of Container Store. Because Container Store is well known as uh, the original storage an organization store. Uh, as you say, uh, it was focused on sim simplifying the family's daily organization. It was opened in Dallas in 1978. And today, the company has more than 80 stores across USA, with uh, over 10,000 storage and organization solutions thinking and design for, for your faithful uh, customers. So congratulations for, for this, for all these achievements. In 1978, with your two partners and uh, co-founders, John Muller and Ger Mount, and yourself, you have the, this vision yeah, to, to start this business. And the vision was that uh, to uh, save time, uh, to save, uh, to organize, uh, the, the space uh, would save time and it, this would be very, very important for, for people's life. Over, over all these years, Keep, uh, the company has been lauded uh, for its focus, uh, especially for two reasons. 
One is for its differenti differentiation, sorry, in, in this concept of inventory mix. And the second one, and maybe most important, is your commitment with employees, yes, as the main formula for, for, for this great success. But uh, what I read from your, from your book that we're gonna talk about it later on, your goal uh, was never to grow for the growth sake. It was rather to boost the company seven values based of conscious capital, capitalism principles. So uh, you build this, this, uh, this business philosophies guiding uh, very important as strategic decisions for container store all, all over these years uh, for the whole community, for stakeholders, for your employees, for customers, for vendors. This is what I call keep uh, you made a systemic ecosystem. Your commitment to your employees uh, has landed in, a, well, in, in, in you achieve to, uh, to consider container store in the Fortunes magazine uh, top list of one of the 100 best companies to work with. Uh, a great place to work, really, yeah? Um, at the moment, just uh, nowadays, you are co-chairman of the Conscious Capitalism uh, International, yeah, the worldwide uh, uh, foundation. And you are actually, you are balancing your daily responsibilities as a member as well of other boards, yeah? Like uh, Just Capital, Southern Western Medical Foundation, Brandstorm, International, between others. So welcome, Kip. Welcome to our session today. And we appreciate so much that you share this time with us, that you share your, your insights about, uh, you know, you as a chairman and uh, of uh, International Conscious Capitalism Foundation. And uh, just share with us all this background, yeah, all, all your career, your, your vision of, of values and, uh, and what you brought, what brought you up to here, yeah, up to here with this philosophy of life and, and work. Well, thank you, Yolanda. That's all very uh, nice and, and, and kind. And yes, what, what we did try to do was um, build a business, the container store. Um, really a simple way to put it is um, our passion and our commitment and in our, in our belief in conscious capitalism uh, 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 builds a business where everyone associated with the business thrives. You know, not, not just the shareholder thrives, but the employees thrive. In fact, the container store, we always termed ourselves to be an employee first uh, culture. Uh, absolutely employee first. Of all, the, of all the stakeholders, we actually put the employee first, not even the customer first, the employee first. But um, the employees thrive and the vendors thrive. And um, we joke that um, uh, even our uh, lawyers and bankers uh, thrive. Uh, and and we, we, we try to make them uh, thrive. I mean, business is really about relationships. And um, um, as we have spent now 40 years building this model that is, uh, thank goodness, thought of as a, as, as, as a great uh, example of a servant leadership, conscious capitalism uh, a form of a, of a business. And it's been, you know, it's been great. I mean, uh, we started um, in Dallas with one tiny store um, 1,600 square feet. I think that's 160 square meters, and you know it's pretty small. And yeah. thirty-five thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> well, thirty-five thousand dollars wasn't very much to start a business with, even in 1978. Yeah. And um, and it's just been wonderful. We've we've loved it. Um, really passionate about making it employee first. And um, uh, what you know, you spend more time working than any other waking endeavor. And so what, what better use of all of that time, of that lifetime of time, than to try to create a business where everyone associates with it thrives. And uh, I mean, the vendors thrive. You can't tell the difference between a vendor and an employee at the container store because we treat them exactly the same. It's a lot of fun and it, and it really does result um, in, a, in, in, in a better business that does better uh, uh, 
you know, the whole concept of conscious capitalism is that if you focus only on the shareholder um, and you're myopically focused only on the shareholder, you're not going to do as well as if you harmonize the uh, needs and aspirations and dreams and goals of all of the stakeholders. Um, that's a much more joyful way of doing business. It gives you uh, engaged employees. It makes you an employee of choice. Yeah, Fortune Magazine running around uh, 100 best companies work for in America. We were chosen number one twice, number two twice, you know, and have been on that list tonight. So when we open a store in a new town, um, uh, they're lined up for blocks to apply for a job at the store. And we're able to pick the top one or two percent, which is a, you know, a, a, a great advantage. But um, I really think that doing business that way not only enriches your lives and the lives of the people that you do business with, but it actually, it's almost too good to be true, but it actually works better than the other methodology. Because if you focus only on the shareholder, as, as, as most of you know, um, the magic is loss and, and, and uh, the, the employees are unhappy and the customers are unhappy and the vendors. But if you take better care of the employee than anybody else in, in, your, in your town, in your industry, I mean, if you really take better care of your employee than anybody else, well, then she's going to take better care of the customer than anybody else. And if those two people are ecstatic, well, then uh, your, your shareholder is going to be ecstatic too. And so simple, um, trying to get from a shareholder primacy form of doing business to a stakeholder form of doing business. And uh, I, I think that's... Um, I think that's maybe the best cause out there. Uh, yeah. as, uh, and I think the world is approaching uh, all of your work that you're doing with your chapter there in Spain and all that. Um, you know, we've been working on this for almost 15 years now. And now we have the business round table saying that they agree, you know, people used to look at us and roll their eyes and think we were singing Kumbaya and things. <laughs> it was almost embarrassing. And, and yeah. now it's so mainstream that's that right. I do think we're reaching the tipping point so the work that we all do now is more important than ever. And um, uh, I think a more just and happy world comes. Business is so important, you know? I mean, nonprofit's important, but business is something like 10,000 times bigger than all the nonprofits in the world put together. So if we can uh, tweak, improve, change the way of, um, of doing business, I think we can have a bigger impact on the world than, than, you know, than anything else. Yeah. Yes, and this vision of human-centered organization that you have, Kip, you, you had this vision before to co-funding a container store. You always had this vision of business, human-centered? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just me. I, I think business is about relationships and it's about people. And the, um, um, most people joke, uh, <clears throat> Ed Freeman, uh, who... Uh, is kind of a rock star professor at, at Darden uh, uh, University of Virginia Business School, uh, teaches a, a class called Business Ethics. And, and we all joke, well, it must be an awfully short course, you know, Business Ethics, and, you know, but, <laughs> but really the world is coming around to that. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting away from the Milton Friedman statement now. It's the 50th year anniversary of him saying that, you know, basically the only reason a corporation exists is to maximize the return of the shareholder. Uh, that's, that doesn't work very well. And that set us back for a while. Capitalism is good. Capitalism has um, really um, helped the world's the most efficient means of getting goods and services together ever devised. But, um, uh, but that kind of something that a lot of people attribute to Milton Friedman's statements that it, it, the, the pendulum just swung too far to that side. And now we need to you know, balance it back. And that would be um, best, best for everybody. But I, um, uh, when I was in high school and college, I kept a, uh, a list of um, the, the best thoughts or the best philosophies or the best ideas I'd ever read or, or been taught or thought of myself. And um, those were kind of my life philosophies. You know how idealistic you are when you're 16, 18, 20 years old. You just love all this existential philosophy and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and all that stuff. And oh my God, I love exactly. that. And um, but I, you know, I really took it to heart. I, I wanted to major in philosophy uh, in, in college, but my dad wouldn't let me. So I, I majored in English, which is the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but from those uh, best thoughts that I'd heard, I, 
I came up with what we call our foundation principles. Um, and they're just uh, seven um, ethical, um, it's just my view of the world. And I, I wanted to build a business where, uh, where those were the ends that we all agreed to. And, um, um, and then we could free our employees to choose the means to the ends. And they're not hard to agree to. They're kind of like, um, okay, it's, um, uh, it's wrong to uh, rob a bank. You know, they're, they're, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're things that everybody agrees with, but we have to know that those are our guiding principles. Those are our philosophies. And as long as you're doing that, you can choose whatever means to those ends that you, that you want to. And that, that leaves you with more uh, inspired and empowered employees and, and, and happier customers. Absolutely, Kip. Uh, as Alfonso was mentioning at the beginning, at the moment we are in, immersed in a huge wall of changes. Yeah, the pandemic has accelerated uh, our lives and core values at the moment, you know, are are more important than, than ever, knowing that what you stand for is more important than, you know, than even before in, in our lives. Which, uh, just to share with our audience, because you have members, we have members now, but we, we, we have people connected today, they are not members of Conscious of the chapter here in Spain. So yep. could you share with us, Kip, uh, which are the, the main seven uh, principles of Conscious Capitalism Foundation that you mentioned in your in your book that I highly recommend because I just read <laughs> uh, your uh, incredible book. So could you share these seven uh, principles with uh, our uh, uh, audience today, please? Yeah, uh, thank you, and I'm honored you read the book. That's that, that's great, um, um, and and it really does explore these seven found uh, container store foundation principles and really the tenets of conscious capitalism. As many of you know, the, the tenets of conscious capitalism are higher purpose, you know, that you have a, a business for something other than just profit. You have a higher purpose. Conscious leadership is uh, uh, the second tenet, uh, the stakeholder model, and, uh, and a, having a conscious culture. Those are considered the tenets of, of conscious capitalism. And long before those were ever devised, we came up with, um, you know, the container stores foundation principles. And it's um, <clears throat> usually when I describe those, it takes, it takes a while, but I, I'll just kind of itemize them and do, do it very quickly. But um, um, the first uh, one of them is a statement that Andrew Carnegie said on his deathbed, you know, Andrew Carnegie became a pretty good guy by the end of his life. He was so high up on Maslow's hierarchy of need. He didn't need anything, you know, that he became very altruistic and very outwardly looking to uh, people. And so uh, a cub reporter from, I think the New York Times or somewhere came to him, uh, Andrew Carnegie on his deathbed and said, Mr. Carnegie, you know, you're probably the most successful industrialist of all time. Is there anything, anything that you want to pass on to posterity, uh, any beacon or guiding light that you attribute all your incredible business success to? And much to the reporter's delight, uh, old Andrew said, yes, there's one thought, there's one concept that I attribute all of my business success to. But what's that, Mr. Carnegie? What's that? Well, it's, it's uh, fill the other guy's basket to the brim, making money then becomes an easy proposition. What? Fill the other guy's basket to the brim, making money then becomes an easy proposition. It's exactly the opposite of what we were all brought up to think, you know, works, works in business. And so that's, that's, uh, that's one of the seven foundation principles. And that pretty well spells out how we treat each other, how we treat, treat our vendors, how we treat our customers, uh, fill the other guy's basket to the brim. And, and, and I believe in allowing your employees to be free to figure out how they do that. Uh, you know, that's, that's what, um, a second one is uh, one great person is equal to three good people. Uh, that's the second foundation principle. One great, and this is an understatement, um, all of us, you know, you're, you're 50 times better at certain things than I am. And so um, we just recognize that certain people uh, can be so much better at certain endeavors than others. And, and that doesn't mean they're better people. It just means they're better at, 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 at this form of business or that. And so we're, we're very, very selective about who we hire because one great is equal to three good 
And we joke that one's good equal to three average and, and one average is equal to three lousy. And, and so, you know, you really, you wind up with a, a team of people that you are thrilled to wake up in the morning and, and, and go to work with because you think these people are all one equals three great. And, and, and that's important to a culture, you know? Uh -huh. um, the, the second, uh, the third one would be communication is leadership. That's what leadership is, is communication, you know? And, and, and um, uh, we think that just about anything and everything can actually be solved and worked out uh, with proper communication. And so we, we, we go into that. We teach people how to, maybe the person you're trying to communicate to is a visual person, or maybe they're not, or maybe they, if, you know, maybe they prefer text or email to whatever. If you're really caring about the communication, you can communicate so much more effectively yeah. uh, by recognizing that communication and leadership, leadership are the same thing. The, the, the next one is intuition doesn't come to the unprepared mind. Uh, you need to train to make it happen. <clears throat> we, um, we spent about 300 hours of formal training, training each new first year employee and the retail industry average is eight. So when we, when we spent 300 hours on you, yeah. It's average, I mean, it's wow. And the way we get that back is that we teach people that um, in this data world that we're in, and, and I'm not discounting the importance of data, data is everything. But, but too many people discount the role of um, intuition. And, and, and your intuition is best on things you know a lot about. So I'm, I, I like to fly fish in the mountains. And, and, and if I'm teaching you to fly fish and I intuit that there's a trout under that rock there, uh, there probably is because I know a lot about fly fishing. And if you intuit there's a trout under that log there, there probably isn't because you don't know anything about fly fishing, but we're teaching you. And so learn to trust your intuition and that together with the data and the information is where most of the greatest insights and genius comes from. People that are afraid to trust their intuition um, uh, are, are, are rarely going to maximize their, their creative output. And so after we spend 300 hours uh, training you, you know a lot about what we've trained you about. We urge you to okay. use your intuition as well. <laughs> and you engage uh, them and you engage them, I suppose. I mean, employees are engaged for the rest of their lives after yeah. these trainings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another one is air of excitement. Um, you know, we think that our stores, if you had a fight with your significant other on the way to before work or something, you know, I mean, it's, uh, we have a re responsibility with each other, uh, our staff, our team to, um, to, to build the excitement through the day. What, what we're doing is, 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 is extremely exciting. We have this wonderful business. We have these wonderful customers and coworkers and so each and every person um, has a responsibility to sustain that air of excitement, to make it a joyful place. I think that if you're lucky enough to be somebody's employer, you have a moral obligation to make sure they look forward uh, to getting out of bed and coming to work in the morning. But um, one, way to, one way to help ensure that is to make sure you don't have uh, jerks at work, you know, and that everybody can be engaged. So air of excitement, an air of excitement is, you know, I, I would like to hire people with big booming voices rather than real small, timid voices and that type of thing. It's, uh, it, it's the theater of retail, the theater of business, the theater of a sense of community. And then uh, the sixth or seventh one, oh no, I guess the sixth one is um, man in the desert uh, selling. This is a silly story that I made up. I, I always joke that most salespeople, particularly retail it, salespeople. It <laughs> Most retail salespeople um, just want to get through life without ever being accused of being a pushy salesperson. So they're kind of timid, you know, but actually the um, man in the desert is a story about your, you live in a desert in the middle, uh, you live in an oasis in the middle of the desert and you see this guy crawling in, in, towards the oasis, hoping it's not a mirage and he's um, thirsty, he's been stranded in the desert for a long time, so you go out to help him and you give him a, a, a drink of water. And then you uh, pat yourself on the back and you think you've done something great by giving the, the man of the desert a, a, a drink of water. But you actually have done very little. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, it's pretty easy to intuit what his needs are beyond a drink of water. So you help him in, you know, 
you, you put him in the shade, you, you, you take care of his sunburn, um, you, you eventually give him something to eat. He, he, he might need some, uh, some type of uh, liquids beyond, beyond just water, electrolytes or that type of thing. You're, you're, um, you're intuiting his needs and you're, oh, you know what? He needs to call his family and let them know that he's okay. They're worried sick about him, my God. And so what else can we think of that this person did? So there's a moral imperative there to take care of the man in the desert beyond just the drink of water. And um, we attribute that to helping a customer in the true sense of the word. She comes to the container store and her kid's toy storage area is driving her crazy. And she's never been able to figure out how to organize that area. It's a mess. It's driving her nuts. And, and so we, we communicate with her and intuit her needs and help her figure that out. And as a result, her, her excitement level and her enthusiasm level, her, her, she's, she's a thrilled customer. You know, she leaves with a high heart rate. And she's coming back. She tells everybody about it. We've, we've, uh, we've done man in the desert uh, selling. We, that's we, what we call, sorry, that's what we call keep a personal shopper, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so this puts the, importantly, this puts the moral imperative on selling rather than not selling. Because too many retail salespeople are afraid that if they sell about somebody something, uh, they've somehow done something bad to them. No, when you've done something bad to them is when you wimp out and don't sell them what the, you know, you don't help them in the true sense of the word. Then they, they've wasted their time, they leave, the toy storage uh, area is still as bad as ever. And so people love to do man in the desert selling once it's simply you know, explained to them and, and they understand they're doing something good for the customer rather than uh, uh, bad, bad for the customer. Uh, let's see, one, two, three. I think that might be seven. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. But those exactly. are... Um, uh, Oh, the seventh one is actually the best selection service and price. Um, I was taught by Stanley Marcus, the co-founder of Neiman Marcus and a lot of other retailers. I really expected that if you could have the best selection around or the best service around or the best price around, uh, you would be very successful in business. So what we try to do is do all three because most people thought they were mutually exclusive. You know, if you have great service, well, then you can't have great price. Well, yes, you can. And so we tried to do that and we, we thought we were pretty successful at, at, at doing that. It's, it's thrilling to build a business that does what people say that, that, you know, that, that can't be done. It makes the employees proud. It makes the customers thrilled. So um, what, whatever you're, the, the great thing about starting a, a business is that you get to build the culture based on your own view of the world and what you think are um, important and, and good and just. And so that's what these foundation principles represent. I, I, never, I never really um, had anybody disagree with these things. Um, that was, I mean, who, it's kind of like the golden rule. Who, who said, no, you know, really, I don't think that do unto others thing is a very good idea. I mean, everybody agrees to that. It's just a matter of knowing how to um, um, really explain that to the other people that you work with so that we're a, um, um, so that we're a team as opposed to, 10,000 yahoos going in 10,000 directions. These are the things that, that uh, draw us together. They're not written on the wall of the corporate office, but if you go into the store and ask, um, uh, ask the employees about the, the, the culture, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you about this. So. Absolutely, Kip. And during all, all over these years of experience as a founder of Container Store, uh, uh, did you have ever any doubts about conscious <laughs> capitalism uh, principles, values? Uh, you end up, eh, eh, you you doubt any time uh, about that you were doing the right thing? No, um, I I I never doubted um, conscious capitalism or these foundation principles. Um, um, you can doubt, fill the other guy's basket, the brim, making money. You know, uh, if you get um, taken advantage of, if your if your honesty and goodness and decency, uh, uh, but but that help that, that happens so so seldom. Uh, we, we did try to be successful enough not to do business with certain pe people and organizations that we think were just, you know, 
not not filled with that type of thing. But um, um, generally, um, when you take the time to really figure out how to create a win-win-win relationship, which is what conscious capitalism is all about, uh, it's reciprocated. And you can't be dissuaded the the six percent of the time or so or whatever it is that that it's not reciprocated. And it doesn't always work. Uh, plenty of um, conscious capitalism businesses uh, don't don't make it. But uh, you know, so the the, the stakeholder model uh, is not going to automatically make your business thrive. It's just going to increase the odds that it does uh, enormously. The the uh, the shareholder supremacy model doesn't work 100 percent of the time either. You know, n- n- neither one is a a, a guarantee. But um, my wife and I started saving half of our um, salaries um, back when we got married. And, you know, I mean, it, it was hard to do because we're only making $700 a month. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we saved it because we wanted to invest it in companies that we thought were, were good and just companies, conscious uh, capitalism type companies. Uh, here in, in, in Texas, it was like Whole Foods um, rather than Safeway or Southwest Airlines versus some of the other airlines, you know, um, um, companies that we thought exemplified uh, take uh, the stakeholder model. And, and that was the best thing we ever did. I mean, we, we actually, you know, now I'm really big on trying to help people understand to invest in the companies that you believe are filled with good and justness and that you, you agree with, um, uh, you know, how they, how they do their business. It's, um, it's the most successful methodology of doing business. In fact, um, uh, I'm hoping to write a book with um, uh, Tom Gardner, who's the um, uh, co-founder of, of The Motley Fool, and, um, and Ed Freeman, who I mentioned, uh, you know, who's, who's considered the father of, of the stakeholder model. And the title of that book will be um, uh, Why the Stakeholder Model is Always Your Best Investment Guide, Always. It really is. I mean, those companies generally, not 100% of the time, but they generally do a lot better than, than their counterparts. And now people understand this better. And so the customers and the employees and whatnot are, are, are demanding that you, that you operate your business this way, which yeah. makes, it, makes it even more so. We are running out of the time because time flies. And I want to open a question Q&A for our audience. Please just uh, make sure that you... Uh, uh, share with us all your insights or questions that you want to ask to keep. Uh, we, we're going to have 10 minutes to share with, with our audience. But before, keep, I have two more questions. For me, is the, the rock star question is about female talent <laughs> in organizations. Yeah. So, uh, what do you think? You mentioned in your book, yeah, you mentioned <laughs> that women are better leaders. Uh, what do you think about that from your experience? Which is the difference? What is for you these essential skills that women have? And of course, men, but you know, this gender balance, how you achieve this gender balance uh, in, in your business? Well, I do think that women make better business leaders than men. Um, uh, and I think it's okay to say that. Don't get mad at me because in the United States, at least, um, the Fortune 500 largest companies, uh, in, in the 500 largest companies in America, 32 of their C- CEOs are women, 32 out of 500. So we're so far from parity. We think we've come a long way. We haven't come very far at all. And, and I think it's okay to, to say that as long as we're that, 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 that far from uh, equity. And you can't talk about this topic without making some generalizations. We're all too enlightened to make generalizations, but you know, we believe that communication is leadership. Leadership and communication are the same thing. Guess who tends to communicate better, right? Okay, that's a generalization. It's not always true. But, um, and then we, we, we love servant leadership. You know, we, we don't like military top-down command structure forms of leadership. We don't think that works in, in today's business environment as well as a, a you know, servant leadership. And, 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 and women tend to, uh, uh, adapt to that methodology a little bit better than men. What, what we're trying to get away from is um, kind of a testosterone overdose methodology of top-down military command structure. 
that's a bad boss to have, right? You don't, you don't other, want that guy. Other structures. Right, right. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of other generalizations we can make. But I, uh, w when I retired from the container store, 17 of our top 21 positions were women, and we're we're very proud about that. And um, you know, I usually say something like, "I just think they're a superior form of being," or something like that. But uh, you know, the the whole the whole Indian uh, notion of balancing the male and the female uh, is is where it's where it's really at. And, and uh, obviously, lots of male leaders are the best leaders in the world as well. But um, uh, I do believe uh, in investing in companies that are still founder led, and I particularly love to invest in companies that are female founder led. So uh, incorporate that into your portfolios, and I think you'll you'll do a little better. So. Yeah. So let's switch uh, gears and speak a little bit more about conscious capitalism just before we open up for questions. Uh, which is the situation of the, which, in which point of the history of the movement are we right now uh, in the foundation, in international vision, Kip? Say it again, I mean- what, Yeah, sorry. In which point of the history of the movement of the foundation of conscious capitalism are we currently? Um, you know, it's it's still early, I guess, but I really think we're reaching a tipping point um, uh, uh, globally on this thing. We um, people actually know what conscious capitalism is now. A lot of people refer to it as stakeholder capitalism. There's other organizations. Uh, Lady Lynn Rothschild has an organization called Inclusive Capitalism. Uh, there's Just Capital, whose board I sit on, and I think they do great work. They they interview the American people to figure out what the American people consider to be good and just uh, behavior on the part of a company. And they teach the companies what those things are. And you know that's, that's very important. I've always thought that of the 20 or 30 or 40 organizations that are, that are kind of like conscious capitalism, if we could get them all to come together and work together to, to try and to reach the, the wonderful time when shareholder supremacy kind of goes by the wayside and stakeholder the stakeholder model takes, uh, th that becomes the norm. Um, I think that the various organizations that are kind of pushing for that can work together. Uh, we can get there more quickly. And, 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 and by golly, uh, uh, Imperative 21, which you can Google, I-21, Imperative 21 is a, uh, a group that has done that. It's comprised of conscious capitalism, CECP, the B team, the B lab, all Branson's people, Just Capital, Common Future, Participant, and Global Impact Investing Network. Uh, so these organizations that believe in this are working together rather than, uh, you know, we poor humans are a little bit tribal in nature. I joke that the Baptist in Texas, the conservative ones don't get along with the moderate ones because they think they're so different. I'm like, you know, you're both Texas Baptists. There's no difference between you. Join hands and come together on this thing. And, and, and goodness knows we have plenty of that going on in the United States right now politically. But um, um, I, I think that uh, COVID has accelerated the, the change to uh, stakeholder capitalism as well as this, it's, it's accelerated in this country, hopefully, um, um, more of a paid medical leave, separation of work and healthcare. You know, we have some real shortages here that caused it to be such a problem in our country because we didn't have the safety net to handle a pandemic that most of the other advanced uh, countries did. So <clears throat> I think it's also pointed to this form of doing business uh, being uh, superior. It's just, a, it's just a superior form of capitalism, you know, to the, to, to the other methodology. So I, I feel like that we're still beginning. It's only been talked about for 14 or 15 years, but um, <coughs> we're getting pretty close to everybody agreeing that it's the way to do it. Yeah, and it's a lot to come, a lot more to come. We have a couple of questions. We have Christopher who asks, uh, do you review each company yourself or can you rely on standards which have been your audited? I suppose he's talking about suppliers, maybe suppliers of container store. This is how I understand the question. Well, I love the whole supplier vendor uh, thing. You know, typically a retailer is, um, uh, is, is very harsh on their suppliers and they beat them down and get the last penny. 
Instead, we try to create a, a win-win-win relationship. Win-win um, is not enough. It needs to be win-win-win. You can have a win-win relationship with a, um, oh, let's pick on the tobacco companies. You could, you could form a relationship where it's good for you and good for the tobacco company, but tobacco isn't necessarily that good for society, right? There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, cost of goods sold that are not shouldered by either you or the tobacco company, they're shouldered by society. So win-win-win um, simply means it's great for you, it's great for the uh, person you're doing business with, and it's great for society too. And um, we build that the same way we build the relationship with the employees. In fact, uh, I'm always proud that you can't tell who's an employee and who's a, um, who, who's a vendor. Vendors over the years, you, you take the time to learn what the needs are of your, of your vendor. Uh, maybe this vendor has their, their low point in the springtime. Uh, that's when their machines are idle. It's all they can do not to lay off their employees because their sales are very low during the early springtime. You find that out and you place your largest order uh, at that point in time to keep uh, their machines and their people busy during that time. That type of relationship building with, a, with, with someone you do business with, that type of synergy um, uh, really forms robust, uh, synergistic, uh, profitable business alliances. And synergy, synergy is done by communication and really caring enough to make both of you a lot more profitable it works a lot better than trying to screw around the other guy because then everybody's staying awake at night trying to figure out how to get back at you. Exactly. And it's not nearly as successful. It's not nearly as fun. Yeah, exactly. And as, as you say in your book, a business is not like a game where, where you win and the others lose. Yeah. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah. You is one of the, the, for me, the most important takeaways uh, in, in your book. I think that's maybe the simplest way to talk about conscious capitalism. It's not a zero sum game. Somebody else doesn't have to lose in order for you to win. In fact, synergy is where it's at. The companies that are taking the most market share and making the most money uh, are the ones that are uh, creating synergies with the people they do business with. The, the, the companies that are uh, making the most money and taking the most market share are the ones that, um, um, that do the most for their customers. If, if you're dealing with a customer, if you're dealing with a company that um, you feel like does everything for them and nothing for you as a customer, you're not dealing with a very good customer a company, are you? So. Yeah, I invite people to participate because we only had two, two, one is a question and the other one is just uh, an insight. Congrats, fully agree with your thoughts and seven principles, a must for a whole life, uh, lived life from Ignacio. Thank you, Ignacio. And uh, just, uh, just uh, feel free to, to, to share your insights or Q&A with, with, with Kip. Um, my question as well is how you envision uh, for, uh, the conscious capitalism future, yeah? The future of the foundation worldwide, how you uh, envision it, Kip? Um, I, think that, I think we just continue to um, uh, help and facilitate um, the movement from stakeholder capitalism to conscious capitalism. Uh, I think we're getting closer and closer to that point. It's thrilling to me because I remember when people thought we were, we were, we were loony, uh, crazy. And, and um, <clears throat> um, if, if a good capitalist, I mean, listen to this, if a good capitalist is going to eventually adopt that methodology, which is most successful, we probably don't even have to worry about all this is going to happen anyway, right? This, this way of doing business truly is more successful uh, uh, even from a shareholder standpoint than the other, than the other method. So I think a good capitalist is going to adopt the methodology, which is most successful. And as they're, um, uh, as they're exposed to this, um, that's why I was so excited when the business Roundtable ad adopted it. Larry, Larry Fink, you know, with BlackRock and people like that uh, uh, talking about this encourages other um, uh, business owners and business executives to, um, um, you know, to pursue this, this form of doing business. It, it, um, uh, it, it does help to be um, 
medium or long-term oriented rather than short-term oriented. If all you're going to do is worry about your earnings call and, and the earnings this quarter, uh, it, 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 it may not always work. But if you and I had a farm and, and all we cared about was the production on that farm this quarter and this year, we'd have a terrible farm in as little as five years. It wouldn't be a very good farm in five years. So we're stewards of the business, much as you would be stewards of the land. And you, um, you balance the short-term uh, shareholders' needs with the medium and long-term shareholder. You're, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a steward. And I think that um, after building a business for several years with that methodology, uh, it becomes, uh, you, you, you achieve a lot of momentum. When, when conscious capitalism is most threatened, uh, by the short-term uh, shareholders or the um, sometimes hedge funds, which are pretty short-term oriented and whatnot, is when a business um, has gone up for many years and then it has a down cycle. Um, <clears throat> the co-founder in the United States of Costco, uh, Jim Senegal, taught me that every great business has, has its stock go down more than 50% three times a decade. I didn't believe him, but I looked into it. And it's, it's, it's absolutely true. Even Every great company has a stock. At that point in time, that's when sometimes your shareholders and your board of directors and whatnot kind of want to start reverting back to focusing solely and only on the shareholder and not on the stakeholder. And so that's when we have to um, uh, be on guard, you know, uh, the most. I think what's left in this movement to accomplish <clears throat> is how we achieve that long-term orientation, even when you're having a short-term downturn. So. It's a shame, Key, because I would have spent hours and hours uh, sharing with you and, and talking to you, but we have to close down the session with two more questions that we have. The first is how to align corporate and individual values, and how would you suggest a leader to start implementing them on organizational culture based on values? Well, I, I think um, uh, I think the individual and corporate values that the, the corporate just just replace that thought and that word uh, with team, and you know there's really no um, I in team. It's T E A M. There's no letter I in there, and um, I I don't I don't see anything incompatible or difficult um, uh, in in, in, in combining the two, so goes the business, uh, uh, goes uh, the individual employee. Everybody needs to participate. We're gonna build a business where everyone thrives. And so uh, the vendor does better when you thrive, the employee does better, uh, the customer does better. Uh, and um, you wind up with employees that are cheering and uh, feeling the same way that a, uh, a football team feels when, when it has a, a winning record or an undefeated record, you know, rather than somebody uh, employees that are begrudging the profits and thinking only the executives, you know, uh, share uh, in the profits. It's, it's, it's a true team approach. It's a true united uh, uh, organization. And it's very joyful. And it, and, it, and it brings uh, excellence because I, I really think this, I think people, human beings don't wanna go to work and goof off and not accomplish much and complain and, and take a nap if they can. Uh, they, wanna go to, they wanna go to work and they wanna work hard and do great things with other people who they think are great and, and, and accomplish wonderful things and go home at night feeling wonderful about what they've accomplished. And so each and every one of you is, has the leadership skills to build that, uh, to build that dynamic, you know, to, to, to build that uh, corporate culture where people are joyfully um, uh, striving for that. And, um, and, and then that builds a better world, one fulfilled employee at a time, because that, that employee is not beaten down at work, they're built up at work. And so they rise uh, their sense of self-esteem and their, their happiness. Uh, and, and, and then when they go home at night, they, they, um, uh, they treat their family better. 
Yeah. They treat, the Golden sure. Retriever better because they are fulfilled yeah. by, by, by their work. So. Yeah. Thank you so much, Keith. They're asking me just to close down the session. I pass the word to Alfonso. I highly recommend to read your book, really very inspiring. And thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Thank Alfonso, you. off with you. Thank you, thank you so much, Yolanda, for, um, for a great session. Uh, I can imagine that for most of you, there are plenty of questions popping up after, after listening to, uh, to, to keep in terms of how, how do I actually make this happen in my own organization? Well, reach out to us, reach out to the uh, Spanish chapter of uh, Conscious Capitalism, Capitalismo Consciente. We're here, we're here to help you. We, we just leave with, the, um, with a note of thank you to, to keep. Uh, you gave us energy today. You gave us reassurance that this is definitely the right way forward and you, you actually said you never doubted it and you gave us also some guidelines because i think those seven principles are a very strong roadmap for bringing these things to life in, in your organization thank you to everybody for joining us uh, we hope to see you soon in another in another event good afternoon thank you <laughs>